Oh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out this morning uh, to the Hadley Court Center uh, for uh, design collaboration at the Bean and Stock Furniture Library. Uh, to the, today's uh, uh, distinguished speaker is Jean-Jacques Lenaf, who is the Vice President of Design for American Standard Brands. And he's going to bring us up to speed about uh, a technology, 3D technology, uh, that has the potential to change the industry, our industry, the home furnishings industry, in a way that potentially hasn't been seen since uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting uh, technology. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about the library. The library uh, has a collection of 5,000 volumes, including many of uh, uh, important historical significance, uh, dating back to the 16th century. Uh, in the future, uh, at future markets, you're welcome to come back and uh, visit the library to use its facilities, the seminar rooms, uh, take a look at our rare book collection, and discover more about what we do here at the library uh, to foster the next generation of design and also designers. Okay, that being said, uh, please uh, welcome uh, Jean-Jacques. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Good morning. Uh, first, I want to express my, my deepest thanks to the, the board of the library for having me this morning. It, uh, we're going to be speaking about a very interesting new technology uh, that indeed will most likely change uh, a, lot of, a lot of things in, what, in our, our industries, um, the home furnishing industries and the plumbing industries that I'm part of. And, um, and it's also giving me a, a forum to share on experience. This was a very, uh, a very personal project, actually. Uh, we, uh, embarked uh, in the project that I'm going to present to you this morning about a little less than two years ago and it has been a, a very fascinating adventure so it's a pleasure to actually share that uh, with you today. Um, we're going to be speaking, um, I'm going to split the presentation in three, three quick um, areas. First I just want to give you a quick introduction um, about uh, 3D printing. Not all of you may be familiar with the technology and all the different technologies, because there are several of them, uh, that uh, are called today additive manufacturing. Then we'll speak about uh, our four sets. You have experienced uh, some of the designs uh, this morning. One of them is at, in the bathroom here. Uh, the two other ones were in the, in the room next door. Um, and I'd actually love to hear your comments, if you have any, on, the, on, the, on these designs. And, um, and then we'll, we'll try to make a bridge between uh, what we experience, what we are seeing, and, uh, and the home furnishing industry. So 3D printing, um, quick, a quick definition, I'm not going to read this long page, but the idea of 3D printing is basically it's a technology that allows you to deposit material layer after layer to create a 3D object. It's as simple as that. Uh, that's why it's called additive manufacturing. Uh, usually it's controlled by a computer system. Uh, the, advent, the, the, the progress in, uh, in CAD systems uh, the last 20 years have really made this technology possible. and uh, and and it's a, it's a technology that can really utilize a, a variety of materials. Um, we have, uh, we're going to be speaking about printing in, in plastic and metal this morning, uh, but you can print, you're starting to be able to print in wood and other organic matter like food, for example. At some point in the future, you will probably be able to order your hamburger and it will be printed in front of you. It might be a scary thought, but, but it will, it will come. <laughs> But when you think about, I think what's interesting with 3D manufacturing, um, 3D printing, is that it, we, we have that first reaction. Well, the first time I heard that, I was also like, oh my God, I, don't, I will never eat that. Um, but in some situation, it makes a lot of sense. So one of the um, proponents of this technology, food printing, is actually the US Army. Because think about how do you feed an army that is far away from your shores? Well, if you can print on-site delicious meals, it's actually a pretty nice thing, right? So, so you, you're starting, when, what's interesting about 3D printing is that it forces us to look at our products and our environment and our industries in a completely different way. And, and that's what is absolutely fascinating and that's why it's called a disruptive technology. Um, another word about 3D printing or additive manufacturing, um, I'm not going to speak about numbers. The point of this slide is very simple. 3D printing is here, it's really big, it's going to become bigger and it will disrupt a lot of things. So do I believe that everything will be printed in 3D in the future? No, um, but it will have an impact on all industries. So, uh, the, 
the, the, the size of this impact is, is still to be discussed, but, um, but it will have an impact, so we should really not ignore it. And uh, so this is why we're, we're here today. Yep. I'm going to cover very, very quickly the, the four main technologies uh, that are being used in additive manufacturing today. Um, so the first one is, uh, is called stereolithography. And uh, basically, um, to summarize it, it's basically, you're basically taking a, a tank of, of, uh, of resin that can be cured using a, a photo system, using light. And in that bath is a, is a tray. And um, basically, you have a UV, a UV laser that cures the resin layer after layer on that tray. The tray moves down as you build up the product. And uh, so it's, uh, that, that, um, that system was uh, patented in 1986, the first pat patent that was granted uh, in this industry, uh, patented by uh, Charles Hulls, who actually uh, is the founder of 3D System, which, was, which is one of the three leading manufacturers of 3D printing equipment today. Um, so the interesting part in, in, uh, in this, um, for the, the critical element of this technology, it's basically, it's a, it's a material that is cured using light. That's uh, the principle of stereolithography. Second technology is called SLS, selective laser sintering. It's the exact same principle, except that now you're melting powder instead of curing a liquid. Uh, but the system is the same. You have a tray, you deposit a layer of, of powder, melt the cross-section of your product, lower the tray, powder, melt it again, and so forth, until you, are, you, are, you, you, obtain, uh, you obtain your product. This technology was actually uh, developed uh, through a DARPA, DARPA sponsored project, government sponsored project at the University of Texas. Um, the um, uh, patent is, no, is now owned by Stratasys, which is another one of the three uh, leading manufacturers of 3D equipment today. I'm going to keep hitting the wrong key, I apologize. Um, third technology is called fuse deposition. So FDM is, um, I think a simple way to describe it is, um, is basically you take, um, uh, it's, it's actually taking your, imagine taking a glue gun. I think someone made that analogy this morning when I was speaking uh, to this person. You take a glue gun and as you melt the, the glue, you deposit a, a filament on a surface. So that's what FDM is. You can take metal, you can take plastic, you can take a number of different materials, and you're depositing that filament on the tray that moves down, and you're depositing again, and moves down, depositing again. What's very interesting about this, uh, this technology is that it's much lower cost than, uh, than the two first ones. You don't have a laser beam solidifying your, your, your material. And um, it's lower cost, and the best part of it is that its patent expired. So suddenly it became valuable to a number of companies like um, MakerBot, for example, out of Brooklyn, New York. And it's kind of the, the democratic way of 3D printing. So today you go to Staple, you can buy an FDM system for less than a thousand dollars. And a lot of people are speaking about the democratization of the technology, the link with the maker movement these days, and uh, FDM is really what's enabling all of that. The last system, oops, sorry, I'm going too fast, is uh, DMLS. So DMLS is actually a, a, a subset of the second technology I told you about, which was SLS. It's a, a powder, again, that gets solidified by a, las a laser beam. The only difference here is that it's, about, it's specifically for metal, and uh, there are some uh, very specific technical requirements uh, when you print in, in metals that make this technology a little bit different. But this is a technology we're going to be speaking about uh, right now. The project that uh, we embarked on um, is using DMLS. Uh, we are printing directly in metal and creating a production part directly from the printer. That may be uh, the last um, piece that I wanted to share also about additive manufacturing is that uh, the technology has been around for a very long time. It has been uh, around since about 35 years. The first patent application actually came out of Japan in 1980. And, um, the first patent granted in 1986. Um, but the technology is really being used for uh, what we call rapid prototyping. And some of you may use it today, actually. Uh, when you create a piece of furniture, you may want to have a scale model that is printed instead of, of made by a, by a, a model maker. Um, so it, it's really about, about prototyping things and creating a, um, a 3D representation of an object. 
what DMNS is, is, uh, is offering us today and, um, and also some of the other systems now that the resins have evolved and are better than they used to be, it has offered the opportunity to create parts that can be used in a final product. And that's the revolution. That's really when we're not just creating a 3D representation of what we have on the screen just to test before we invest in tooling. This is not what, the, what, the, what this talk is about. What we are speaking about is really creating products that, go, that are production parts. And um, the MLS is used um, in, that, in, 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 this, in this way by companies such as GE, for example. GE actually is one of the easy, uh, the, the owner of the largest production capacity in the United States uh, for, of the MLS machines. And uh, they use it to, to uh, print uh, jet, jet engine parts. And uh, because it allows them to have parts that are more efficient, that are lighter, use less material, um, and, um, and yeah, weigh, weigh less, which translates into huge savings uh, in the aviation industry automatically. Um, so so that, that's what, um, what the MLS is bringing us about, the ability to have uh, production parts. So just before we get into uh, the, the project itself, I just wanted to give you a very quick, uh, just a few words about DXV. Uh, DXV is a brand uh, that these uh, this, uh, four sets were designed for. And um, the premise of the brand is really um, that the American Standard has been looking at 150 years of design evolution, or style evolution. And uh, so we articulated the brand uh, around that, the history that we have witnessed and around different uh, style movements or design movements. So classic, golden era, modern, and contemporary. And the reason why I wanted to share that is because uh, you'll see in, uh, when I'll show you the, the, the path that we followed when we developed these products, that I think there's a tendency uh, when you use a very cutting edge technology to develop very cutting edge looking products. And we wanted to demonstrate that that's not necessarily the case, that we can actually design in a classic movement using that cutting edge technology. And I, I, hope, I hope we succeeded. So um, the project started really as an investigation. Um, again, we understand that the, the technology is there to stay. We understand that it's gonna change a lot of things. And we didn't want to be a witness of what was going to happen. We wanted to be an actor. And the only way to, you can really comprehend such a disruptive uh, technology is by really participating in, in the dialogue in, in what's happening. So we said, OK, we, we're going to try to print up some products in 3D, production parts. And uh, the thing that we wanted to investigate were really what will that mean in terms of development cycle? Like how are we going to design these products? Is it going to speed things up? Is it going to help us in launch product faster than we do today? Um, we wanted to see um, how we did that disrupt our factories because we have factories. We purchase product from uh, our OEM manufacturers, but we also have our, actually most of our products are made in our factories. So we wanted to understand what, what the impact of the technology was going to have on that production tool. Um, we wanted to understand invent, uh, the impact on inventory management. Uh, when we discontinue product or when we discontinue brands, there's an uh, impact on, on our financials. And we wanted to understand, well, is that impact going to still be there uh, if we print in 3D? And, um, and last, a customization. How can we connect with our, with our customer uh, in a different way and maybe have a slightly different business model by using this technology to actually maybe look at bespoke designs or, or more personalized version of a design. So when we started, um, I think the, the fascinating part of the project was the beginning. We said, okay, how can we write a design brief using that technology? What are we gonna do to make this product interesting? Um, a number of companies have, have printed products uh, that they currently make uh, to investigate some of the points that I just mentioned. Um, but for us to print a faucet the way we are making a faucet today in using this new technology was actually was really pointless because why would I use an expensive high-tech technology to do what I can do today in a conventional way? So the challenge that I gave the designers is, well, design something you can't make. And that proved to be interesting um, because as, as, as industrial designers and I, as product designers, we are trained to utilize the, the limitation of the manufacturing tools that we're using, may it be metal stamping, plastic injection, brazing, anything. 
we, we, are, we are taught to utilize uh, these, these, these tools to the, the maximum effect to actually achieve an interesting, an interesting result. But we always work with these constraints. I mean, some, if, someone, if you think that an industrial designer has a better job, has an easier job when they start with a blank sheet of paper, it's not true. We actually train to work with constraints. That's what makes our, I, I, that's the best part of my job, I think. So when I went to the designers and said, okay, I don't want to see one product that I can make today because I'm not going to be interested in it, that became a very big challenge. And, um, and we had, as a group, we had to unlearn a lot of the things that we were, we were trained to do. And um, so we started, we looked around, we wondered about um, beyond uh, the aspect of, of the manufacturing aspect of the product, where could we find inspiration for this product? And we, we, we really desired to create a unique, unique experience because to have a, a product that is different is to me rather interesting. And being different just for the sake of being different is, is really pointless. To create something that, that talks to your, the user in a different way is really, is really the holy grail. Create a, an experience that is totally unique, surprise and delight the user. That, that's what we were after. So we looked, we looked in nature, we looked, in, uh, looked at the, the water falling in a waterfall, the water being shaped in a, in a stream, um, we looked at architecture, I mean, it's very interesting structures. This is from a, uh, Vladimir Fasukov, a Russian architect from the first half of the, of the, of the 20th century, who was focusing on, on developing very uh, material efficient structures uh, for antennas and water towers and so forth. So we, we, we looked far and wide um, and we landed on basically two uh, experiences that we wanted to create using some of these inspiration. And, um, these are some of the sketches that, that were created during the, during the investigation, even called the concept phase. And these, these two um, experiences were, the first one was we wanted to, we wanted to put a, pull a little magic trick on our users. We, we wanted them to be surprised to see the water arrive at the tip of the, of the spout and wanted the, the, the spout itself be kind of dematerialized and, and, and disappear. And uh, so you, probably experienced it in the bathroom, the, one, one of the, the, the four sets of designs that has that, that lattice work, um, I think achieves that where you, you're looking at the water flowing from the aerator and you're like, well, where is it really coming from? And uh, so that was the first experience we wanted to create. The second experience was a little bit different um, as we went and looked in, uh, in nature and, and I mean, I'm sure you will experience walking in a forest one day and there is a brook and you are hearing and hearing the water and seeing the water that is bouncing on rocks in this very, very soothing way. And we wanted to recreate that. So the second experience was different from the first one in the sense that we actually started from the design of the water and then walked backward to design the faucet, which was an interesting uh, approach. So the first, the first um, direction ended up, uh, so here you, you see that, that mesh structure of the, the faucet that is installed um, in our bathroom here, um, we literally have um, every, every branch of that lattice structure is actually containing a waterway. So you have eight waterways bringing the water all the way up to the, the tip of the, of the, of the spout um, in, this, in, in this really, uh, really interesting fashion. So I, I, th I, think, I think the first experience was achieved relatively well. I don't know, you, I'll let you be the judge. Um, and uh, the second one is this, uh, this design that is on display in the, in the, in the room uh, over there. And um, this one was a little bit more challenging because, um, again, we were not starting from a structure, we were really starting from the water. So we could have created a faucet with a, an open flume that with some shapes into it and the water would just be um, coming out of it. But that, I can make that using casting tomorrow, it's not a big deal. So we wanted something a little more special. So we actually ended up developing uh, this, uh, this design. It, uh, it incorporates 19 different waterways uh, that deliver the water in different area and in, in different points in space. And what, uh, what, I, what I, find funny, I find fascinating about it is that it's, it's, um, it started as a really great idea and then we started printing it. Actually, I think I have one of the original print, because of course all of these were printed as prototype before they were printed in metal. Um, I can't tell you the first one that we turned down. I think everybody got soaked because it looked like a, <laughs> like a hand shower that like <laughs> split out water pretty far out. And, um, and so we had to actually go back from the design 
uh, from our, our CAD system and, and, and our test lab and go back and use, we have a, we're very lucky, we're being a large company in developing products that utilize water in general, we have um, what we have a, what we call a CFD uh, system. We have a CFD team, Compu CFD stands for computational fluid dynamic. We have a, uh, computers that calculate the behavior of water within a solid, basically. And so we, we went back, did all our, our CFD testing, and literally tuned every single one of these waterways. And if you look, actually this one is a, a later model, but if you look at the one over, over there, um, every one of these waterways is, the, the outlet uh, and, and the, the cross surface is actually tilted in a specific way, just to take this different, uh, the flow of water, um, from these 19 waterways and concentrate them in a certain way so that they can come connect and, uh, as one and, and bounce on the, on the surface of the faucet. So it was a, this one was a, um, took a long time to develop, but it was, uh, I think the reward was actually quite, uh, quite fantastic. So these are some of the designs that we created. Um, actually, what was interesting is that I told, uh, told the designers, design something you can't make. And, at some point, we, we took it too literally. Some of these designs actually could not be made, in, even, <laughs> <laughs> even using 3D printing. And, um, and so we, we pushed the envelope a little too far and found the limitation of the technology, which was good, because that's exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to learn from it. And, um, but now we're very frustrated, because we really like this design. Now we have to find a way to, <laughs> to make them. But so these are some, some of the designs that were generated during, uh, during the course of the of, uh, of, of our design phase. And uh, the three in the middle, it's a little small to see, but all the ones that are, that are here and will be released to market. So now, uh, now that we had the design, uh, we had to build the product. So I'm going to show you a quick video of the build of, of these different parts. Um, I told you uh, DMLS is about um, laying out um, a layer of, of metal powder and then melting it using a laser. So you're going to see this machine and you'll see that um, we had the discussion earlier uh, with someone from the industry who is with us today. 3D printing, everybody's speaking about it, and I think the media are sometimes making it sound like, oh, this is great. I press a button and it prints, and it's magic, right? Well, it's not. It's really not. Um, you'll see that um, when we 3D print uh, this, this full set, first of all, they have to be built on top of, a, of that tray that I told you about. It's called a build plate. That build plate um, receives a metal. The metal is actually become part of it. It's really an extension of the build plate because you're printing the same metal, it's fused into it. So once you have that, well, you have to actually come back and cut it and separate it from the build plate. Then you have also what we call support structures. All these technologies, if I, if I, if I print this faucet like this, but imagine I was telling you about the layering, right? You go layer after layer after layer after layer. I arrive here. So I'm starting to print this solid. This doesn't exist yet. I'm starting to print this solid. What supports that part? Well, nothing. It's just it's a liquid or powder underneath. So I need to build a wall that goes from here to here to support it. So you'll see on the video that you have these big plates that come from the base plate all the way to the, to the, to the, to the, to the top of the spout to support it during the construction. When you print in plastic, easy. Cut it out, break it, throw it away. Now we're, we're printing in stainless steel, so it's a completely different story. So you'll see that there is another part also, which is that to do with, okay, now I have my bill plate with my three sets of four sets on it. What do I do with it? And uh, so let me just, I hope this is, uh, here we go. Um, so this is, this is a CEO's uh, machine, so machine from Germany. Uh, so the computer that is, um, that is controlling it, and you see the, and actually, I let the video speak for itself. Um, this is the sintering of the powder uh, on the tray. So each layer, uh, in our case, um, was about 20 micron thick, so very, very thin. So imagine how many layers you have in a, in a product of that, that uh, height. Um, that translates to time, and that tray takes about 150 hours to print. Um, so you imagine if something goes wrong, and it happened a few times toward the, the end of the build, you throw away not only the material, but also 150 hours of, of print time. This is uh, the wire EDM that separates the parts from the build plate. And then there's hand labor. It's not all machine and, and, and computers. You actually 
I have to break all of that up and deburr it. So, so the idea that, that we just <coughs> press a button and it just comes out is, is, is quite far from the truth, <laughs> quite far from reality. It may come at one point, but uh, uh, I think we're still, we're still pretty far off. So we can produce a full set in, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, less than an hour, right? You cast it, machine it, finish it, assemble it. it it's a pretty, pretty quick uh, automated system these days. So this takes way longer, but you can print them one at a time whenever you need them. And you can do that with a traditional uh, manufacturing method. And uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit because that, that also has, um, has a, big, a big impact on what we are doing. These designs, let's, let's admit that they were, that we could mold them, right? Well, we probably would have never done them because once you start designing a product, you have to commit to inventory, you have to commit to tooling, you basically have to invest hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into a product. It's a huge commitment, zero commitment. I, print, I mean, I, I, we spent time, we printed a few samples before going to metal, but if I start printing them tomorrow, I don't have a tool that is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in a factory. It's done. So, so that, that's, that's where it's very difficult to compare the two um, because it's, um, um, it's just a completely different way of approaching production, basically. So um, let, let me get to the, the last step of, uh, of our manufacturing process. We, we could have, at the end of the video, you saw that the, the product is kind of like cleaned up by hand and we sandblast everything. And, uh, and, and so we could actually have just stopped there. And, um, but we felt like, I mean, because of the uniqueness of the design, uniqueness of the product and, um, and, and the market that we were addressing, which is a luxury market, um, we needed to go one step further and make it, make it a little bit more special. And, uh, and um, bespoke manufacturing a lot, has a lot to do with not only quality and, and exclusivity, but it also has to do with the craft, the quality of the craft. And we wanted to bring back a human element. So there was, I mean, you saw in the video, there is certainly a human element there. But we wanted that extra layer. So what we did is that we actually worked with uh, uh, someone who does a lot of uh, metal finishes for uh, special orders for Tiffany. And uh, so someone who's really used to that very niche market and very exclusive market. And, uh, and we worked on finishes with her. And we decided to use what we call a butler finish. So the butler finish, as the name indicates, is, is that the finish that you find on silverware after the butler had been polishing them over and over again for, de for decades, right? So that, it's that very, very, very so beautiful but hand-applied and irregular finish that you find in, 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 uh, in, the, in, in silverware. And that's what we decided to apply uh, on, on our products. And I think what, what I love about it is that uh, it creates that dialogue that you see on the picture on the right um, where, where you have that, that kind of like rougher and more industrial finish on the inside and that absolutely beautiful hand applied finish on the outside and makes it a little bit more valuable and interesting because at the end of the day it's all about creating stories, right? And uh, so that, that's how we, we are adding the last chapter of a, of a manufacturing st uh, story. So these are the three, the three designs. I mentioned earlier that DXV really plays um, across a pretty wide spectrum in terms of style. So this is uh, the result that we ended up having, um, going from a, a much more uh, classic uh, aspect to a very contemporary one. And, um, and I think we were successful at, at, at trans translating these different, uh, these different design movements into, into this design. What I love actually about the first one is that it's probably the one you notice the less, is that you walk into a room, this faucet is there, you have a, a very classic environment, it's not out of place. It's just, oh, yeah, no, there's nothing special to it. And then you turn the water on, you start looking at it and say, but wait, how is that working? And, uh, and so, that, so the effect, again, is, uh, is achieved. Um, what was interesting in that video is, is that that last, uh, that third design, uh, we had a video of it uh, uh, with the water running, because so, I've been telling you about that book for a little while now. So. Last part of, uh, of this discussion now, how, how does that translate to, to your industry, to the home furnishing industry? Um, we have, there is a connect, I mean, they, obviously we were, we're talking to the same client, we're working on products that are part of their environment. Um, and uh, so I think what, what was it, what's, um, 
the, the few key points to remember here is that um, 3D printing allows you um, or, or offer you the opportunity to create a story. And I think a lot of people are more interested in the luxury market today in being in the nose and in the show. They are really interested in understanding what's behind a product. It could be, um, it may have to do, usually when you create a, um, a connection, an emotional con connection with a product, it's either through, um, through, through the content or through the provenance, right? And here you really have a, a content to tell, a story to tell to your customers because of the way it has been designed, the way it has been manufactured and integrated into, in, into an environment. And, um, and the 3D printing obviously offer you the opportunity also to create unique designs and, um, and, and, um, and be at the forefront of, uh, of your industry. And some people are doing that today. And, um, uh, in very surprising way. And what I like about some of the experiments that I'm going to show you is that they all express um, a very interesting thinking uh, process. It's not, again, it's not just taking a product and printing it in 3D. It's about what can it change. Um, the designer here, Bram, Bram Jinnan, um, actually there are a lot of Dutch designers I was rehearsing this morning I realized I think half of the, the examples are from the Netherlands. Some very good things happening there. But what this designer did is that basically he looked at, uh, at what 3D printing can give him to create this, uh, this tool and this, uh, and this chair and, it's, and he created a composite. So you have a very, very thin carbon fiber skin and behind it he reinforces it with 3D printed, a 3D printed structure that is designed to basically just take the load exactly where it's needed and that's it. So you have a very, very minimal amount of uh, material that is being used to create a very sculptural form, form that, is ex that is very functional. In this other example, um, the designer, uh, I'm not going to pronounce the name right, Lilian van Dahl, um, really looked at the way uh, so far a chair uh, is made. And so you have a number of different elements uh, that address different functions. Uh, the structure, uh, what creates softness and comfort, uh, what creates ventilation throughout the parts and so forth. And she tried to find a way to combine these elements into one by using 3D printing. So again, this is a very, all these products are very iconic. So they, they are very, very strong uh, visually, but that was not really the point. The point is really that she created a structure that is comfortable, soft, can basically function as a very comfortable chair as a structure needed to support you. Um, have all the cross ventilation that you need so that there's, I mean, the product can last for a long time. But she's doing that with, a very, with an economy of material and she's not, using, uh, she's not using wood, she's not using fabric, and she's not using natural resources, basically. So it's an interesting, again, uh, thought process. Here, um, the designer is really, um, it was actually interesting, I'm gonna, switch to the next slide right away because that was the installation they had in London not a long time ago. Um, they basically had a, this robotic arm that use uh, that, that deposit material to create the table and the chair, it's, uh, an FDM uh, technology. And, um, and again, they are doing the same thing. They are trying to maximize the use of the, of the, um, of the material and create a very sculptural object out of it. And it's printed out of 100% recycled plastic. So. They are, there's very often a, um, a sustainable and green aspect in a lot of uh, these investigations. Speaking of which, um, this, this one is, is uh, it's, I love when designers think, spend a lot of time thinking so that they actually could not design product. And uh, I'm not probably the best way to say it, but what's fascinating about what, uh, what this team did is that they looked at the impact of our products in the environment. And very often when you think about furniture, um, we bring material to a factory, we build a piece and then we ship it. And except if you're IKEA, very often you're shipping a lot of air, right? And it's big. And so there is an impact on the environment from all of these different uh, operations. So what a designer did here is try to find a way to cut all of that away from the, from, from the chain, from the supply chain. And so they created a, a line of product uh, that utilize um, raw materials that you can find locally, pieces of wood that are pretty standard, and they created connector pieces. So their design is really in the connector piece, and that connector piece can be printed at 
the local, actually even UPS has 3D printers today, at the local UPS store or at your printer at home. And uh, so they, are, they actually created designs that does not require the whole supply chain that we have in place today, which I find fascinating. Um, this is maybe a little bit more artistic. That the door handle was created by, um, by um, taking uh, the data from a 3D scan, and 3D scanning is not perfect. So the designer actually utilized the, the imperfection of the scan to create the culture, to create to create that mesh, and then create a sculpture. Just an interesting. Um, I mean, and I'm, when I'm thinking about how how you can use. I mean, all, all what I showed you so far of furniture that are entirely made out of, uh, except the last one, of, of, of 3D printed, uh, uh, they are entirely 3D printed. But you don't have to do that. You can actually just create accents that get incorporated into the, the furniture, which I think is just as interesting. Now, this is um, there for a reason. It's also a transition to the next uh, scale, which is the home. Um, and there's a reason why I want to speak, to touch upon um, a 3D printed architecture because it has, a, it also has, it may have a direct impact on what we all do. Um, there are a number of different tests that are being run right now where uh, different companies are printing homes. Uh, China is actually going very fast in that. Uh, there's tests in the Netherlands, in England. And the idea here is, uh, is I mean, the, the building industry uh, takes a long time it takes a long time to build a house, takes a lot of energy, has a lot of waste and in the materials and in, in, in the energy being spent. And we are looking at, uh, people are looking at 3D printing to actually streamline that process and make it more efficient. So this is um, an interesting project uh, for a resort in, uh, in Beijing. And here the architects try to actually mix the 3D printing with conventional manufacturing, of uh, conventional building, sorry. And um, to create, I mean, it's formally, the, the, the formal expression is very interesting, but it's also, uh, they are playing with light, the quality of the light inside the house uh, here. So this is still very decorative, um, but um, when you look at, um, at what is being done in China, for example, um, it's basically an FDM system that deposit uh, layers of cement uh, that creates the walls. And I mean, the filament they are using is probably about an inch and a half in diameter and they're just basically building the wall. So you still assemble all the windows and everything afterward, but it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's, it's, not as, it's not about the aesthetic, it's about really the efficiency of the process and the zero waste. Um, actually, I'll, I'll take you even further out. Um, Norman Foster, Foster and Partners just finished a project with the European Space Agency, where the idea is actually to send a robotic arm on the moon so it can use moon dust to print a house. And so that you can actually print habitation in space using 3D printing. When you think about it, um, how much would it cost and how complicated would it be to ship a house to the moon? Well, it would not be very easy. You just ship the printer. And uh, there's another company that, we, that, uh, that, that has sent a, a 3D printer on the International Space Station. They are called Made in Space. And you can print tools on the internal station today. I mean, it's again, I was telling you it's about really looking at things in a completely different way. So back to Earth, um, 3D printing and architecture. The last project I want to share with you um, is to me one of the most interesting. It's uh, um, four designers, uh, so design collective in London, uh, they're called soft scale design. And uh, three, <laughs> three years ago, um, they started this, in, this, this, um, this research project. Uh, they wanted to look at, okay, if we're going to be 3D printing a house, how can we make it affordable and efficient and therefore affordable? The problem with a lot of the technologies that are being used today is that they use a lot of material. And material is expensive. And since there's a direct correlation between the amount of material you use and the time you spend, well, the machine time is as increases and, and, and so forth. It, the way it's done also in most cases is that the printer has to be bigger than the house. So that creates all the types of limitation. So what they developed is, uh, is a, basically a series of algorithms that takes the design of a house and um, kind of create the same type of structure that you have in your bones. It's a very fibrous structure. They remove material. 
And, uh, and so they are using uh, a 3D printer that has a much higher resolution because they have less material to print and create this very fibrous structure that has all the mechanical characteristics of a normal wall, but using just a fraction of the material. Now, because they are using a finer printer, they can print much more than just the wall. So they print the plumbing and they print the furniture. So full stop. What does that mean for us? You can download a file, download a file, download a file, go to your local distribution center that print houses for you, and it's going to print a few blocks that you're going to bring to your land and assemble, and everything will be there. Now that, to me, is both exciting and scary. <laughs> it's what we call disruptive, right? And, um, and so, for example, for us, uh, on, as, a, as, as a plumbing manufacturer, I mean, what is going to happen 10 years from now if you start going down that path? Um, are we still going to be making, I mean, we are probably best known for our toilets, are very efficient, they work very well. Are they going to become part of the house? Are they going to still be ours? Or are we going to have to actually go from the toilet and maybe print bathrooms? I don't know. But that's what this project was all about, is actually investigate this, this uh, for getting to this discussion, because obviously something is going to happen. I don't know how far it's going to go. I don't know how fast it's going to go. But these are the dialogues that are, that are taking place today. So, so I'll, I'll let you think about the impact on, <laughs> on, on your work in, uh, in the decades to come. Um, just to conclude, uh, a few points. Um, Lessons learned. It's not that easy. So as we talked about uh, during uh, in the past hour, um, I think there is an image of 3D printing that it's really about about just having a printer, having a computer, hitting print, and and here is your product. It's not that easy. Uh, there's a lot of constraints uh, that exist, and and from a, a designer standpoint, especially for design student today who are in school or looking at that, thinking, wow, I'm going to be able to print anything I want to do. Well, that's not the case, because there are things that 3D printing don't change. You still have some things called structural engineering. If I design something with a gigantic cantilever and almost no material here, I'm going to have a problem, no matter how you make it. So you still need to understand the laws of physics. That doesn't change. Industrial design, um, connecting uh, the function, the form and the function, and uh, and, and the brand, actually, which is part of that. These skills don't go away, they don't change. Uh, material science, you still have to understand which material you're going to be using. Uh, a lot more materials are available today in these technologies than before, and I think it's going to grow even more. Maybe one day, actually, you'll be able to go to your printer and turn a few dials to select the mechanical characteristic you want out of your, of, of your material, and it's going to make the mix and start printing. So you have to understand what materials are about. And, um, and of course, all what we do, uh, everything that goes into a, a, a constructed environment is linked to, human, to the human body. So human factors won't go away. Our bodies still will sit in a certain way, we we'll still will interact with sandal in a certain way, we we'll still will want actually on a more, uh, um, uh, on a less physical level, we we'll still want, we'll want privacy and still will want to communicate a certain way. All these factors won't go away, so the traditional skills of designs won't change. But the way we approach the design process, I think, will still be there. And uh, it will, will, will evolve, sorry. And um, just CAD skills, still very important, and actually more important today than, than before. Uh, I can guarantee you that, uh, um, actually, I'm, I'm a very, very lucky man. I have a, an, an extremely, uh, a team of extremely talented designers. I, I'm pretty good at CAD. I, I could not have modeled this, and uh, so they are way better than I am. I'm extremely talented. So these skills are very important. Um, and I put 3D scanner at the end also because there's going to probably be an interesting um, impact on what we create and what we copy. Which, and I'm not going to go into intellectual property right now, but there's going to be a mix here that will also um, allow us to, or allow some to actually create objects in, in, in a very different way. Maybe I'll come here and scan a part here and just add it to another construction and, and, and just print it. I don't know. Um, a few more thoughts. Um, we spoke about inventory and, and tooling, tooling commitments, the impacts that, uh, that the technology has on, this, on these two areas. Uh, again, these products would have never 
uh, come to fruition if we had to commit to the tooling and and uh, an inventory the way we do in our in our in our conventional lines. Um, printer access, I think. Uh, I think we're going to see a whole service industry developing uh, around this technology. Uh, I, I was it's actually a shock. Last week I was in Charlotte. I was visiting one of our customers, and I had to pick up a box at the UPS local UPS store, and I pull on the parking lot. And I look at the window and it says, in big, we 3D print at UPS. So um, this is it's a small printer in a UPS store, but you may have uh, a warehouse with a, a farm of big 3D printer one day and you're going to go and pick up your furniture there, maybe. Um, there's access to a wide range of material. We spoke about uh, briefly about that. Um, sustainability is an interesting uh, component of 3D printing because um, it changes radically the supply chain and you can manufacture locally. Um, now I think especially when we're in high point, this is a region that has been affected by globalization. And um, when you think about this, um, that again will change the, the game. Uh, if we're going to be able to manufacture locally. A lot of people are extremely concerned over, about the impact, the social impact of the technology, uh, fearing that it's going to eliminate more jobs in the manufacturing industries and so forth. You saw the video, it's not simple. So they're actually going to be, I think, a lot of job, high-skilled job created around this industry. Uh, people who actually um, will go back into the manufacturing industry, people who understand the way it works and what needs to be done to a part to. To, to, to be delivered and, and, and so forth. Um, new, bu new business model around customiz customization. Um, actually, I'm going to go a little bit off a tangent. One of the, uh, one of the premise of the project, and um, I didn't want to phrase it that way at the beginning, but um, actually my, our former CEO said, okay, wh what about democratization of design? And it came out meetings after meetings after meetings, and I'm like, but hey, what about democratization of design? I'm a designer. I went to college. Why do you want to give it away to everybody? And do you think that everybody can design? And it's an interesting um, discussion because the tools potentially could be available. Um, I, this is an opinion. I personally don't think that we'll see that happening because I don't know about you, but I don't think many people want to spend time designing their faucets and their plates and their furniture, and their car, and everything. What we as human beings, as social beings, what we usually look for, we look to curate our environment, curate the product around us. And to do that, we embrace certain brands, we embrace certain designers, and we go and seek what basically we can connect with. I don't think people are gonna to want to design and print everything around themselves. Um, if you, I mean, you, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I think we, 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 so the power today, the power of brands are so strong that I think it's the best demonstration of it. Now, what may happen though is that you may see um, social networks um, change the game because someone may design something, upload it, make it available to the community, and people will download it and print it, print it for themselves. I think this will happen, it's starting to happen already, but when you really think about it, it's no different than buying into a brand. You're buying into that person's brand, that's all. So, so the, 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 the way the, the, the system doesn't fundamentally change. So, and, um, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much for listening. And I don't know if you have any, any question. If Children download toys, database, and print them. No, no, actual physical toys. And, um, and, and I think, again, with that whole maker movement, you have a lot of people who are designing, I don't know, cups and plates and, and things that make, and make them available uh, through, uh, through this network. And people download them and print them. And it is so true, and, and it is, again, I, I go back to the, to the story element, is that it, it's about establishing emotional connection. You've, 
you know that someone has touched that product and finished it and that there was time and attention spent to it, it has a completely different value than a mass-produced item. And, and to me, that, that's, that's the important thing because uh, we, we live in a, in a society where people are slowly moving away, and especially actually at the high end, moving away from uh, the idea of accumulating possessions to, accu to experiencing things. And, and so that emotional connection is really important, and that's, that's a great thing. It's funny because we, we started speaking with, uh, with uh, a few of our, our closest uh, di uh, distribution partners and, 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 and showroom partners. And, um, and at first we thought, well, well this, is, this is a nice thing, but let's not put too much hope into that. And the reaction was quite the opposite. And uh, because, because of the story that it creates and the uniqueness of it, and uh, so we believe that there is a market. But we also believe that the technology is still, and it's 35 years old, it's a little more recent for metal. The technology is evolving very quickly. And uh, so, again, we're jumping in right now. And, uh, and I think what we're going to see is over the next, I don't know, 10 years, because I don't think it's going to take that long, actually, we're going to see the, the price drop. We are, we, are, we are finalizing our, our, our pricing right, right now, but I, I'm going to give you a very, very broad range. <laughs> it's, uh, so it, each, <laughs> uh, each four set is going to range somewhere between ten and $20,000, basically, wow. at this point. Yeah, no, actually, we have a manufacturing partner. We didn't invest in the, in the, in the equipment itself because they are, they are report to a million dollars each. So, so we, are, we, we utilize just one machine uh, when we printed our first set. And, um, and we have, uh, we're working with that partner to actually expand. I mean, they, they are, oh, you have to understand, you, you go to this facility and our, our, pro, uh, our four sets are being printed next to parts that are going to the, I don't know, defense industries, the aircraft industries. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's still pretty high end and pretty high tech. And, uh, but, but we're working with them to expand their, uh, the, the, the number of machines that they have and make it a little bit more, a little bit faster, a little more uh, accessible and so forth and optimize the manufacturing. So. Yes, at this point, yeah. I mean, we, I, I, we actually found out uh, since we launched about uh, one other company in New Zealand who is uh, using not exactly the same technology, but something very similar um, for a very, very specific application, which is basically for private aircraft and, and, and luxury yacht, because they are trying to save weight. And, uh, but but there is, there, the four sets are very like, conventional looking. They are just printed in a different way, and they're printing in titanium. By the way, all of these four sets are printed in stainless steel, um, which, so that's why we actually have them all code co compliant. If you want an upgrade and want it printed in titanium, it's not a problem. We actually can. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's one of the alloys that we can, uh, we can use. So. So that, that's the process that we are going through, and, and I, I can't talk to you very intelligently about it because that's not really my area, but, but that we are actually working with a few partners uh, in, in very selected showrooms, in very selected area uh, to, to launch a product in January. So I think by January, we'll probably have the full set installed in maybe as, as little as five showrooms. I, I don't know exactly what the numbers are uh, these days, but it's very, very uh, selective. Any design school will provide you, who can provide you the, um, the fundamentals of design, uh, design skills is, is, is very well suited to, to prepare you for that technology. I think, I think most of the design school today are investing in 3D printers. And uh, even if they are uh, low-end FDM machines, I don't think that they are investing in this kind of equipment, but, but the principles is the same. So um, I, I was asked actually by, by a, a blog not a long time ago, if I thought that there should be a special class for 3D printing. 
And I thought about it and I was like, well, when laser printing came out, we didn't have a special class. When color printing came out, we didn't have a special class. So I don't think there is necessarily a, a need for a special class to learn the, how the technology, because technology is actually relatively simple to understand. I think what's needed is, uh, is, is information and probably lectures and so forth about, about how, to th how to approach the, the technology. And it's no different than when you're in design school and you learn about plastic injection. You have plastic injection, you have metal forming, you have metal casting, you have, and you learn basically the, the possibilities of the, t of, of the technology. It's no different with 3D printing. You have to, because I think that the, um, the risk with 3D printing is to think that oh, I can do anything and I'm gonna do everything. And um, that's just stuff that should not be printed. You don't need to. And, uh, so if you're going to be using the technology, push the boundaries and create something that is really worthwhile. So. Absolutely. I think, I think the, the last slide with that house is a, a little bit about, about that, is that I think the, um, the boundaries between industries may end up being blurred because of that technology. Because you could actually have someone uh, designing uh, a bathroom vanity, incorporating the faucet into it because you're printing everything at once, for example. So I think that there, that there is a boundary between industries that is going to start getting very, very blurry. And so I think it's interesting if we can create bridges between these industries and try, try in, to investigate that together because, because yeah, we may be part of that more f that one industry in the future, which is would be home. I don't know home decoration or home furnishing in the future. I don't know, but uh, but yes, I think I think it's important actually that uh, a dialogue is established between between the industries and, and the collaboration. And it it, it I think I think what I, what captivated me during this whole experimentation was that it not very often in our lifetime we can witness something that disruptive and, and, and we are just at the beginning of it. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I invite everyone to actually look into it, try, see how you can incorporate it. I mean, today, maybe, I mean, the challenge of our products is that they are highly functional products. Um, I mean, they can't leak even 20 years from now. And say, I mean, they are very, very, very stringent uh, requirement. But why not trying it with decorative objects? Why not creating, I mean, you have people today printing uh, lampshades in, uh, in, in, in using this technology and they are absolutely beautiful. And so these are areas where you can, you can start playing tomorrow and, and why not? And, and see where that takes you, so. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.